For those of you old enough to remember, some years ago, President Reagan gave a speech stating that Nicaragua was not very far from Arlington, Texas, and that the danger of an attack led by the Sandinistas under Daniel Ortega on Texas was not to be minimized. And thus, this was one of the justifications for setting up the contrast. Daniel Ortega has now been inaugurated. President Bush has congratulated him. There has been no panic in Harlington, Texas. <laughs> and the New York Times did not even see fit to mention the inauguration in any of the issues that I have seen. So obviously, things have changed with regard to Nicaragua. And the present panel and its distinguished speakers will give us an idea of where things have gone and where they are going. There have never been more poor in the history of Nicaragua. There has never been greater inequality. And there has never been such a breakdown in public services and in what people would call the indispensables of life, including in employment and, and basic security on the streets or in the countryside, hunger at levels that we had not seen before. And maybe related to all of that, the IMF thinks that Nicaragua could, be, could not be doing better because all that says that the macroeconomics are are in place. The perspective I, I present is one that Nicaragua requires a radical shift and change in regime. Um, that, it, that has happened twice before, once in 79, uh, once in 90. And the question today is whether a change in government means a change in regime. Or does it mean the continuation of the previous regimes? And the very preliminary reading of electoral results, as well as the opportunities and problems derived from the present in international and regional situation, leads us to believe that there's elements that would lend support to either thesis. We want and we need a regime change. And precisely on account of demanding a regime change is, is why not a few of us that call ourselves Sandinistas have been very critical of Daniel Ortega and the leadership of the Sandinista National Liberation Front over the last five years. Because precisely the way in which they have gone about trying to get themselves back into office, who knows of its power, office, apparently successful, has been at the, has, may just be at the price of having to sacrifice the expectations of Nicaraguans, including the overwhelming majority of those that voted for him, demanding and expecting a regime changed, something that was not promised by the, the candidate and that was not implicit, certainly quite the opposite in the campaign dynamic where the efforts, uh, the, the, the very vague messages were on reconciliation, were on peace, were on harmony, were on love. Um, we can do it if we all just come together. Let me just break this down, because um, my colleagues will can go into greater detail, and later we can we'll discuss more. The, the result of the election, and what are some of the factors that we have to keep in mind in order to make an honest, important ongoing evaluation of what some people believe is is yet another left government. And what we are emphasizing in, in Nicaragua is that 
don't call this government left because when it fails, you'll be able to say the, the left failed. But maybe we should get this terminology um, straight uh, right away. Let's, the most difficult thing, I would try to be subjective, but let's try to be objective and be able to say, notwithstanding tremendous misgivings, we have to recognize three things. One is that this was a legal process that gives, that brings forth a legal winner. I say legal, I will not say legitimate because as Rose and Michelle can explain, the process itself was, was so distorted. But legality is there. Um, second, we have to recognize that legality, that reality, that we have new authorities that are the product of an electoral process, however imperfect. And third, that there are very pressing immediate demands that we genuinely wish this government can meet. And just to cite the most big, the problem of hunger and extreme poverty, the problem of health and housing. You know, we're, we're talking about people in life and death situations who can't afford to wait till the end of the debate or, or a policy implementation that need immediate redress now. And if this government can do it, this is fine. What is the internal and the external factors that this government has to deal with. The first, if we talk about the internal factors, and my colleagues will go into greater detail on that, I'll just run through them, the limitations of power, the limitations with which it comes into office. It won, it won with 38%. It won with less of a percentage that it had lost in previous elections on account of the split of the right. That objectively is a limit on your power. It's not Evo Morales, it's not Chavez that have huge mandates and consequently um, pretty broad or strong majorities, perhaps not strong enough for, for, for Evo, but in, in, the Congress, in the Congress itself. That is not the case. You've got 62 percent of the Parliamentarians that are not um, uh, are not FSLN and are against them. Um, secondly, the second the limitation it has it's arrived is that the Sandinista again it's more difference from from Morales. Um, there is no mass movement that would propel um, a candidate into office to carry forth. What you have is an electoral machinery uh, of the FSLN that was able to gather the core of what are fairly solid, disciplined militants, which more or less gets you at 38% of the electorate. But it's not a movement that is propelling a candidate. Unfortunately, it's a candidate that's propelling what is not a movement. Um, and if the next element would be, as much as we try to judge objectively the new government, we necessarily, historically, analytically, have to take into account what has been the trajectory of the candidate and of the leadership of the FSLN, unless they're going to change that overnight, which would be difficult for them to do, although some believe they will do. You know, then first and foremost, just, just to tick them off, these, the Daniel Ortega's own personal ethics in the face of credible accusations 
of, of sexual abuse of his stepdaughter. That should have been a disqualifier from the beginning. It wasn't. Second, the, the genuflection, I want to call it that, before the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, which is the most right-wing in all of Latin America, including having ordered its its deputies, because the FSLN did have deputies, a strong bloc in the Congress, so you, so you, during these past 10 years, so you can derive some sort of political analysis on what they're, where they stand as a party, and they supported the abolition of therapeutic abortion, the abortion for reasons of life, which puts you in the category of El Salvador and, and, and Chile today. It's, it's abhorrent, and they want to call themselves left. The, in core, the building of not only alliances, but strategic alliances with what are the most corrupt components in Nicaragua political life, beginning with former President Arnoldo Aleman, convicted, yet out of jail, and even expecting a pardon because he has a working political understanding known as the Pacto with Daniel Ortega, which colleagues will talk about a bit more, and that shows no indication of having been broken in, since, since the election. And with, and with that, the alliance with what, would, what were objectively outright contras, counter-revolutionaries, that were on the CIA's payroll, and that led the role, they led the contra forces, and those forces are are now there represented, and they are the actual vice vice president elected. Jaime Morales Corazo. Daniel dies tomorrow. We have a contra as president the next day. Who's a conservative businessman, and you know. He, it's, it's not him, it's what he represents. He's a nice guy, but that's irrelevant. Now, you're going to say that, and, well, and add one more, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Frente Sandinista supported the, the free trade agreement with the United States, CAFTA, the bilateral trading uh, agreements with the United States, which give investors every right and a lot more. The, under, the framework agreements with the IMF and every piece of legislation that the IMF has wanted, they have gotten the support, the FSLN. So that's, that's what we're dealing, that type of political, political trajectory. All of that internally doesn't look good vis-a-vis -vis the type of regime change that we are demanding, that is needed. Externally, Central America continues to be, Central America is still, in many senses, works as, <coughs> as a single nation. If one country goes too far ahead, a little bit less Costa Rica than the other ones get nervous. It's, it's, it's not South America, it's in, it's, it's, the Central America is fundamentally run by conservative governments, and Daniel wants to and needs to fill into that. There is an acute commercial, and this reinforces the first point, and trade, finance, uh, interlocking with the rest of the Central American economies, particularly El Salvador, and within the North American context, over a third of the trade with the United States. And it's, that's not propitious for, for sharp breaks and, and for repeating 19, 1979, nor is the fact that one third of the Nicaragua's national budget is, is made up with external, external cooperation funds. 85% of infrastructure in Nicaragua is funded by somebody, by one of the development agencies. It's a country acutely dependent on external assistance, and that comes at a price that no one believes there's, there's non-conditional. So that doesn't look good either. But, and here we get to the big but, um, what, 
why is this still a moment of opportunity? And it's, and it's derived at precisely in the context of what's happening outside the region. Um, the weakness of the USA that's too distracted in Iraq to, to even think coherently about Central America, apparently. The IMF is going through a crisis of legitimacy. It doesn't have that much power. And then comes the last factor, which is only materialized, we've seen the dimension of over the last week, and that is the Chavez factor. Venezuela is going to be, looks like it's going to be, one of the most important pillars of this new government. Vis-a-vis -vis the, the amount, we knew that a cooperation and help would be coming. But from what has been announced, it's, it's three things. It's massive. It's, right now, it's amounting to 600 million, which is more than every other contributor put together gives in one year, and that's one year. Secondly, it's diversified. We're talking about banks. We can go into the um, credit, refineries, aluminum processing plants, housing, things that, that would turn the Nicaraguan economy around, given that it is a small economy. You don't have to make that. And, and the third factor is that it is coming at, at a very, and you know, they're not giving anything away, but the conditions are such that not only can you pay back easily, but also you make money in a refinery. They are income generating and employment generating um, a cooperation deals, and they could lessen, they can give Ortega more flexibility in not only meeting immediate needs, and not only meeting being able to go around the IMF and loosen, not totally break, but at least loosen the stranglehold it has on the country, um, being able to negotiate by cooperation in better terms. But third, and, and I'll just conclude here, um, it would open up the possibility of this radical change, of the regime change. If, they, if he can if they can turn the economy around with this massive help, build up his support in the polls, and there's talk already of the Chavez and Morales route, call the Constituent Assembly, change the Constitution, reframe, redesign the state in order to make it more amenable, more reflective of, of direct democracy vis-a-vis as opposed to representative. That would be way down the line, but that is in certain minds. Whether it goes down that road or not depends on a whole series of factors. I've mentioned, I've mentioned most of them, but there is an opportunity. And we just pray that the FSLN doesn't blow it and can indeed mark a historical change in its political behavior, and indeed will be able to push the envelope on the more on the strategic proposition that is embracing a lot of Latin America of how far we can re rein in the market and begin to build the, the new building up of the public sector, the renationalizing of resources, the reassumption of economic sovereignty, the construction of multilateral regional trade agreements. That will indeed create the counterweight that the United States needs in that region. Okay, thank you. There are several features in Nicaraguan politics over the last you know, decade plus uh, that, that are characteristic, I think, of extraordinary politics and sort of atypical politics. They emerge in times of crisis. One of these is these broad coalition building processes where you have unlikely, you know, yet more strange bedfellows joining together in some kind of coalition backing a candidate. 
Uh, this is really very clear in 1990 with the UNO coalition composed of 14 political parties and movements that were across the board in terms of ideology, and yet they all came together around the idea of trying to oust Daniel Ortega. So it's kind of crisis politics. You see it elsewhere, I think, at different times in Latin America, the whole concertación process in, in Chile, I think, is a reflection of that, too, the, the forging of a coalition of the center to the left in order to defeat and to bring about um, transformation after the military period. So you see it in, in Nicaragua. Uh, you know, starting in 1990, uh, then again in 1996, you can see the result here with Aleman and his liberal alliance uh, bringing together lots of different uh, factions and fractions of, of the liberals and some others to generate a coalition getting 51%. Then Bolaños, you know, with the PLC, but others backing, including conservatives, getting the 56%. Uh, so you see that kind of extraordinary characteristic. What we see in 2006 is in some ways, again, the normalization of um, political life in Nicaragua, maybe depolarization of um, electoral politics in the country, because there were a lot of tensions in that coalition, had been for a long period of time, tensions about style, tensions about program, tensions a bit, a bit about ideology. Uh, and so now we reach a point where um, the... Um, fear of an FSLM victory is not so overwhelming that it brings together these these groups and, and um, um, subcategories of various political parties that um, really were quite a bit at odds with each other. So that's what I mean when I talk about the normalization of politics. These are natural divisions that had emerged that were really apparent in all kinds of ways uh, are now uh, allowed to unfold and take the form of these different coalitions to running against each other as well as against the Sandinistas. Um, so the fear of the FSLM victory is not so overwhelming, overwhelming that it shapes everything else. Another thing that seems to be normalizing, again, not necessarily a positive development, but um, um, nonetheless there, is a decline in voter turnout. I have included some information about that as well, so that you can see um, what the voter turnout of registered voters was. In 1990, it was 86%. It was a very high rate. It places Nicaragua at one of the, you know, sort of toward the top and the t upper tier of uh, turnout rates for Latin American countries uh, during that time. Uh, it's, it's dropping a little bit by 96. Um, and again, in 2001, now down to 70%. So you're seeing a, a gradual d uh, drop off in the turnout rate. I think the IDB did a study of... Um, um, political and, e and electoral characteristics of Latin American countries from the 80s up to 2000, and they found that the average turnout for presidential elections was 73 percent at that time. So now Nicaragua is dropping a little bit below what was the average. Again, kind of a normalization. Um, Nicaraguans still participate, obviously, but much better than people do in the United States, but nothing like at the level that they did uh, in that election in 1990. And there are other things, too, you can, you, can, you can see that seem to represent a kind of normalization. Uh, the, de I think, a decreasing, um, well, a decreasing number of international observers, a rising number of domestic observers can also be taken as a sign that, that the political life, the electoral life is normalizing. There's m less of a need for the international validation of the results and a growing internal domestic capacity to be able to monitor and, and establish legitimacy and do research as necessary about key problem areas. So that's, that's part of what's going on in, in the configuration that we're finding. Second thing is the change in the institutional rules. As Alejandro mentioned, the 38% the, uh, the that the Sandinistas got, and Daniel Ortega got presidential candidate in 2006 is actually below what they had received um, in previous elections that they lost. So you can see, uh, you know, they lost in 90 with 41 percent. They lost in 2001 with 42 percent. Um, um, and this is a, an artifact of the changing in institutional rules negotiated between Aleman and Ortega and then uh, um, producing a constitutional change in 2000. Prior to that change, um, uh, in, in order to avoid a second round, you had to have 45 percent of the vote. 
and so that what they negotiated was a reduction to 40 percent and then under the in the condition and the circumstances where there was a five percent point lead it could drop as low as 35 percent so that's how you get to this situation where you could win with only 38 percent and and not have to go into a second round so there was a change in institutional rules that obviously made a tremendous impact and he would not have won had those uh, rules not been changed I think there there could be a lot of questions you know that wasn't a question about legality because you know it was according to the rules but there is a question about legitimacy probably would be much more in the way of a question about legitimacy at least in international circles were it not I think for the Mexican election one with only 36 percent of the vote and a one percent gap right uh, and it, again, I'm thinking about this in terms of how the U.S. government responds since we were delighted, I think, with the result of the Mexican election, even though it was a squeaker, it became very hard for us to criticize a 38 um, percent victory when there was a 10 percent gap with the next ranked candidate. So um, that's a second sort of set of themes we could think about. Campaign effects. There's a lot to discuss here, this whole emphasis on love and reconciliation, you know, give peace a chance, the new uh, theme song of the campaign, the colors that were used, very little of red and black, a whole lot of gold and, and the kind of a bright pink. Um, so that got a lot of attention, a lot of discussion, clearly there's a different kind of projection of image that the Ortega campaign was cultivating. The alliances we've heard a little bit about and that we're going to hear more about in just a minute. So I won't say more about that now. Um, the, uh, there have been a number of studies about a couple of other campaign issues. One is media coverage of the different campaigns. And it was kind of surprising to me. There was a study done by the uh, European Union on uh, media coverage in the last month of the campaign, looking at uh, candidates and, and parties' coalitions. And uh, I was surprised to see that in each of the three media types, uh, radio, TV, and in the print media, the Sandinistas actually got more coverage than uh, any of the other candidates. And uh, although not all of it was favorable, in the, on, in the radio coverage, um, it, it was over the Sandinista, the gap was 67% um, 60, of the coverage was of the Sandinistas. 15% was of the Montelegre camp, and then only 8% of the Riso camp. Um, so a, a tremendous gap there. And 73% of that coverage uh, was po of the Sandinistas was positive. So it's kind of interesting to see the way in which the media could have played a role in um, encouraging people to think in a different way, perhaps, than they might have in the past about the Sandinistas. Uh, and then there's campaign funding. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, domestic monitoring, one of the domestic monitoring, electoral monitoring or organizations, Etica y, y Transparencia, did a report on the spending from July to October and found that um, the Sandinistas spent more than anybody else, $6.3 million on their campaign versus uh, the PLC with $5.6 million, the the Montelegre uh, Alliance with 4.6 million and the MRS with 1.3. So it's also interesting to see the way in which the Sandinistas were able to gather the resources, the financial resources with which to run this uh, pretty elaborate campaign. There was a dramatic increase in the amount of spending on this campaign overall compared to 2001. There was about a 40 percent increase over what it had been um, five years before, adding all the camps together. Um, so uh, I think probably uh, access to the media, access to financial resources, a new kind of campaign, opportunistic alliance structures all play a role, some role, in determining um, Ortega's ability to um, project himself in this highly competitive race. The last point, just real briefly to mention, is the economic model, uh, because he only got 38 percent of the vote, and even with the MRS, we're still only talking about 44 percent of the vote. That's the uh, um, reform Sandinista movement. Um, you can't say that the Nicaraguan people repudiated the economic model that's been um, shaping economic policy since 1990, but you can say that they clearly didn't buy into the idea that this model had worked well for them, because if they had, presumably they would have voted for Montelegre, 
who was uh, li the lineal descendant, you know, fine, it, it, um, of the Bolaños camp and the, and the Bolaños administration being the most orthodox of the three administrations post-revolution in Nicaragua. So if they had been persuaded that the Bolaños administration was on the right road and that Montealegre represented something similar, would carry out similar kinds of policies, then presumably his vote would have been much stronger than it was. And he clearly did not do all that well with only 28% of the vote. Um, so it does seem to be at least you know one reasonable interpretation is that it does reflect an interest in change, how much change in what direction you know there's still a lot of questions to be worked out but um, it, it's uh, there would be no doubt that voting for the Sandinistas would be in spite of the you know the moderation, the new tone and all, all those things would be an, ex an expression of a desire for change to move away from what had happened in the post revolutionary period. Um, and, and that seems to be in the offing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say just very quickly is on the back side. It's about the uh, Assemblea because um, it also shows, you know, one of, one of the areas of challenge that or the Ortega administration will have. This is a um, um, table that gives us information about the diputados, the deputies in the national legislature. and the parties that they come from, uh, how it broke down in, in 2001, um, and uh, then how it's breaking down now in 2006. So you could see the PLC obviously did very well and won a clear majority, but then it begins to fragment between the Aleman camp and the Bolaños camp, and so um, you have um, um, major problems for the Bolaños administration and this new coalition that's formed between the the uh, Aleman and Daniel Ortega to to make most of the decisions that are taking place within the assembly. Uh, in 2006, um, the FSLN will have you know has it has 38 seats formally out of the 92 overall. Um, it's actually uh, got a little bit more than that in practice because one of the um, the uh, Monte Alegre diputados. Um, Salvador Talavera, ex contra, uh, has signed a, a pact with the FSLN, so he presumably will support them. And one of the MRS diputados has also defected. So, in fact, they at this point have something like 40 uh, um, votes in the legislature, but that's far short of what they need. They need 47 to have a majority. And um, so they're going to have to they're going to have to engage in coalition building and alliance forging and all of that in order to be able to get measures approved. The suspicion is that they will fall back on the alliance that they had created in the previous administration with the PLC and that that will then lead to uh, extra capital for Aleman that he can use for his benefit in various ways. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to play with the idea about internal crumbling of different um, coalitions and uh, also what, uh, what an, an, a coalition between the um, Monte Alegre group and the FSLN would look like and what, what they, where they might agree and where they might disagree. Let me start off by stating that something odd has happened to Nicaragua since the November elections. Um, as you know, for years or for decades, the country has been very much polarized between pro-Sandinista forces and anti-Sandinista forces. Yet since the elections took place in November, Ortega has enjoyed quite a sort of a political honeymoon in the sense that he's um, experienced quite a significant increase in popular support, including uh, from those who in the past would have never dreamed of supporting a Sandinista government. Um, as Rose pointed out, he gained 38 percent. He won 38 percent of the vote in the elections in early November. And according to polls taken in December, that is a month later, his support among the Nicaraguan population was about 60 percent. Um, so the point I want to stress right now is that Nicaraguans, whether they be pro-Sandinista or anti-Sandinista, many of them do seem to have the hope that Ortega's government will finally be able to solve some of the country's profound social and economic problems. And as Alejandro pointed out, these are profound problems. Um, Alejandro mentioned that Nicaragua right now has one of the greatest income uh, gaps in the world. Uh, hunger is a 
very pressing issue. Um, Rose and both Alejandro also talked about the previous governments as being very corrupt, and there's a great frustration in Nicaragua with this form of corruption. Um, and there's also extreme poverty that Alejandro pointed out. And just to give you a sense of the poverty, about 80% of the population in Nicaragua right now survives on a daily income of uh, $2 or less. So their point I'm trying to make right now is, is that there is an apparent political honeymoon that Ortega is currently enjoying. But as Alejandro pointed out, there are quite a number of Nicaraguans who wonder what kind of government did they, uh, will he preside over. Um, so in many ways, Daniel Ortega poses a puzzle. Um, probably you've encountered this puzzle um, in, the, in the media um, because he also poses a puzzle for a lot of international observers. For most international observers, the question is, whether Daniel Ortega will embrace the apparently more radical leftist politics embodied by someone like Hugo Chavez or Evo Morales, or whether he will ultimately adopt the more moderate, the seemingly more moderate uh, policies of leftist presidents such as Lula in Brazil or Kirchner in Argentina or uh, Bachelet in Chile. In Nicaragua, however, and this is something that Alejandro uh, pointed to, there are quite a m number of people who are wondering whether Ortega will actually rule as a leftist. So the question there is not, is he going to be a radical leftist or a moderate leftist, but is he actually going to be a leftist? And I know Alejandro doesn't want to engage in this game of labeling, but actually a lot of Nicaraguans do, and, these are, and the people I'm talking about right now are more public intellectuals than anything else. Um, in fact, a lot of these public intellectuals um, view Ortega's election not as a victory for progressive politics, but rather as a triumph of conservative politics. Um, in other words, they, to use Alejandro's uh, phrase, they're not hoping for a regime change. In many ways, what they're thinking, what they think that is going to happen is that there's going to be, con in many ways, a continuity of the kind of conservative policies that the previous governments, that is, the governments that have been in power since 1990, have implemented. But I also want to share Alejandro's I, uh, um, emphasis that this things are still very uncertain in Nicaragua. I think a lot of Nicaraguans are uncertain what kind of Daniel they actually voted for. And because the more conservative side of Daniel Ortega and also the FSL is not as well known outside of Nicaragua, I thought I'd present, uh, focus my presentation on this aspect. That is why so many uh, Nicaraguan public intellectuals believe that Ortega's electoral victory does not necessarily represent a triumph of the left and thus don't necessarily see his victory as part of the so-called Latin America's broader turn towards the left. They come to this conclusion largely based on, uh, for two reasons. Um, and the first is something that uh, both Alejandro and Rose have, have emphasized, is that the kind of, they point to the kind of political alliances that both Daniel Ortega and the party, that is the FSLN, um, has, has forged in the last uh, 10, 10 years or so, uh, since about the early 1990s, mid 1990s. Um, and Alejandro mentioned uh, some of these alliances. Uh, the first one, and let me just single out four uh, alliances that uh, the FSLN has forged with conservative sectors of Nicaraguan society and politics. The first one is the most known one, that is the alliance that the FSLN has forged with um, Arnoldo Aleman and his party, the, the PLC. Um, as Alejandro pointed out, uh, Aleman was president of Nicaragua from 1996 to 2001. He is probably, at least since 1990, he's probably the most powerful anti-Sandinista politician in Nicaragua. Uh, it also happens to, he also happens to be the most corrupt one. Um, he's currently serving a 20-year jail sentence uh, for having embezzled over $100 million during his presidency. So that's the first uh, alliance that I'd like to sing out. The second is... Uh, also one that Alejandro pointed out is that the, he, uh, the Sandinistas have forged an alliance with the Contras, um, and an alliance that ultimately culminated in Ortega's decision to uh, have Jaime Morales Carrasso as his running mate, and as Alejandro pointed out, uh, Morales was a key, uh, leading negotiator with the, with the Contras. The third group um, that I'd like to point out are the Somosistas. That is, um, not necessarily people who are part of Aleman's party, the PLC, but rather members of Somoza's 
party, that is the PLN. Things might be a bit confusing, but it's in, in Nicaragua, it's important to, for Nicaraguans, it's important that actually the PLC and the PLN split in the, in, in the 60s. And so the fact that the Sandinistas actually um, worked hard to formalize an alliance with the very party that symbolizes or embodies Somozismo is rather surprising in Nicaragua. And um, during the past year or so, uh, leading Sandinistas has also been making some overtures to Somoza's, the last Somoza's son, who is known in Nicaragua as El Chinguin. And the fourth group that um, I want to point out is the church. Um, that the Sandinistas have forged, worked very hard to forge an alliance with the, with the Catholic Church, especially with its leader, Cardinal Miguel Obando y Bravo. Um, I didn't know it, but Alejandro pointed out that this is probably the most right-wing church in Latin America, but there's no doubt that um, Cardinal Obando has stood out as being one of the most important anti-Sandinista uh, figures in, in modern Nicaraguan history. And as Alejandro pointed out, this support or this effort of the Sandinistas to court the church has culminated in the, in the, recent, uh, in the recent vote for, uh, a ban uh, for totally uh, banning abortion in Nicaragua, uh, a vote that was held in the National Assembly that is in Congress shortly before the elections and a, and a, and a bill that was supported by the Sandinista faction. Um, the belief of many Nicaraguans, particularly public intellectuals, that Daniel and the party, the FSLN, has essentially turned right, uh, was re reinforced by the people who attended the inauguration that took place last Wednesday. Uh, that is the inauguration of Daniel Ortega as president. Um, in the international press, uh, the presence of foreign leaders was... Uh, was prominently displayed, particularly Daniel's embrace of Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales. And this is something definitely that a lot of Nicaraguans noticed, but they also noticed something else that happened at the inauguration, something that has not been really commented upon in the international press. First, that the Cardinal Olobando gave a very important speech at the inauguration, a speech that in many ways embody, uh, symbolized the, the, the newly founded alliance between the church and the Sandinistas. The second thing that happened was the presence of Arnoldo Aleman, who was invited to the inauguration. Um, he is supposedly serving a 20-year sentence um, under house arrest, for uh, allegedly for health reasons. Um, but he was invited to the inauguration, and that made a, a big splash in Nicaraguan newspapers. So the point I want to make here is that because of these alliances, a lot of Nicaraguans believe that Daniel Ortega and the party have, have turned right. Now, it's certainly possible um, that these alliances were made more for strategic or opportunistic reasons. But there are quite a number of analysts who wonder whether this turn towards the right is, is, is more than just simply political opportunism. Um, whether it has actually changed, uh, to a certain extent, Sandinista ideology. And in doing so, they just point, point to the fact that um, the Sandinistas did support this very totalizing abortion ban. So that's the first reason why, I would argue, why so many, well, quite a number of leading Nicaraguan public intellectuals wonder whether uh, the electoral triumph of the Sandinistas in November really does represent a victory for the left, or on the other, or on the contrary, if it in fact does, uh, represents more victory for the right. Um, the second reason why they would come to this conclusion um, has to do with the fear of quite a number of Nicaraguans, but particularly public intellectuals, that both Daniel Ortega and the FSLN will promote, once they're in, gov once they're in the government, will promote what they call the rule of caudi caudismo, that is caudillo rule. And what's interesting here is that they use the term caudillo and not populist. Um, obviously, the difference between populism and caudismo is very complicated, and I don't want to open a can of worms here. But in the Nicaraguan context, at least in the present-day Nicaraguan context, caudismo is usually associated with a form of backward, anti-democratic form of rule that typified the country's political culture from... Uh, independence in the early tw early 1820s up to the triumph of the Sandinista Revolution in 1979. Um, when you talk about caudillos in modern Nicaraguan history, uh, the caudillos that usually spring up, up, pop up are someone like Anastasio Somoza Garcia, that is the first Somoza, the founder of the Somoza dictatorship, 
Um, and then the conservative caudillo like Emiliano Chamorro, who for a while was uh, Somoza's leading opponent, and of course more recently Arnoldo Aleman. Now, I think the fact that quite a number of Nicaraguan public intellectuals currently identify Ortega and the Sandinista party with caudillismo is especially striking, since the Sandinistas did lead a revolution that appeared to be bent on eradicating caudillismo from the body politic. So what do they mean now when they claim that Ortega and the Sandinistas will rule as a caudillo? As you know, the term as it's used in Latin America usually is usually used to describe the personalistic rule of a charismatic strongman, that is, of a caudillo. But in the case of Ortega, there are few Nicaraguans who believe that Daniel Ortega possesses the kind of charismatic leadership skills of prominent leftists such as Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, and of course Fidel Castro. Instead, the fear in present-day Nicaragua is that Ortega's government will promote what social scientists call uh, clientelistic or patrimonial politics. That is, they fear that a government led by Ortega might do two things. First is that they will run state institutions as if they were fiefdoms of patronage, um, thus reducing their independence, their accountability, and also undermining their uh, nonpartisan nature. The second thing they fear that an Ortega government will do is to try to further centralize power uh, by weakening key pillars of uh, civil society. And here they're particularly worried about that a government might um, undermine the power of the media, uh, non-governmental organizations, and independent social movements um, such as Nicaragua's very powerful feminist movement. So in short, um, it seems that a number of Nicaraguan public intellectuals fear that Ortega's government will practice a form of caudismo that will promote not only corruption and cronyism, but also undermine the system of checks and balances that they believe is important to uh, democratic rule. Now, as I mentioned, this fear is somewhat ironic um, since the Sandinistas led a revolution uh, that explicitly um, that explicitly was against caudismo as embodied by somosismo. So why is it um, that Ortega and the FSLN now are so widely identified with caudismo? Let me just mention two factors that, or two reasons why I think this identification resonates so powerful, powerfully among certain sectors of Nicaraguan society. The first is one that I've already mentioned, that is the so-called pact that the Sandinistas uh, formed with um, Aleman and his party, the PLC, in 1998. It, it, they started f negotiating this pact in 1998, and since 1998, it has been reaffirmed various, at various moments, uh, probably most noticeably in January of 2005, when Daniel Ortega actually trekked to Aleman's finca. Um, and as Rose pointed out, um, you know, this pact has resulted in key changes, both to the Constitution and to electoral law. I, I don't want to detail, go into much detail about these changes, other than to mention that these changes, that is the pact, uh, strengthened the grip of both the PLC, that is Aleman's party, and the Sandinista party over the political system. The idea essentially was to turn Nicaragua's political system into a two-party system, uh, very similar to what you have here in the United States or in Great Britain. But what a lot of Nicaraguans believe actually what the pact did was that it it brought about the politicization of key state institutions that in their you know that should be neutral um, in particular allowed Ortega and um, Aleman to have their followers take control of key state institutions such as the country's main anti-corruption agency electoral councils uh, the Supreme Court and the public prosecutor's office so it's not surprising that many Nicaraguans denounce the pact as a ploy of the country's two most powerful caudillos um, to essentially divvy up control over, the, over key state resources among themselves and their cronies. So that's the first reason why I think so many public intellectuals have now come to identify Sandinismo with caudismo. The second uh, reason has more to do with what's happening internal to the Sandinista party. 
And in fact, this is something that happened before the pact was signed in 1998. And it has to do with the way in which Ortega and his group of close associates have been able to centralize power within the party since the party lost the elections in 1990. And in doing so, they've also squashed efforts to democratize the party. I don't want to detail all the challenges other than to say that there have been uh, major challenges to Ortega's control of the party and that all have failed and generally the end result has been on the one hand the expulsion or resignation of key Sandinista members and on the other hand the concentration of power, further concentration of power in the hands of Daniel Ortega and his uh, closest associates, and usually when we, people talk about Daniel's closest associates, uh, the term the Sandinista bourgeoisie often pops up. This refers to leading Sandinistas who, um, after 1990, became, um, through various means, uh, very successful and rich entrepreneurs. What's interesting is that whenever faced with a challenge, an internal challenge, Ortega's group has always attacked the Sandinista uh, dissidents in the name of party unity. And it's this call for party discipline that in the eyes of many um, public intellectuals has only strengthened their view of Ortega as, as a caudillo. In many ways, they now say that as a result of these internal struggles that were, you know, that were played out in the 1990s and also um, up to the present, um, that Sandinismo essentially has been transformed into what some people, what many people call Danielismo. So, in the eyes of many Nicaraguan public intellectuals, the transformation of the um, or the identification of the Sandinista Party with Gaudismo is essentially a post revolutionary phenomena. That is something that has happened after the revolution ended in 1990. My sense, however, is that Gaudismo probably played a much more important role in uh, shaping the party during the revolution and probably also the course of the revolution. Uh, numerous studies have shown that in reality Gaudismo is a much more complex phenomena. Um, that in general Caudillo's control over their social base um, is anything but absolute, that often they have to negotiate with their social base. Um, and this can even be the case of Gaudismo as practiced in a, in a, in a rather authoritarian context. Um, you just have to look at uh, some of those studies in Nicaraguan history. I'm thinking of Jeff Gould's a wonderful first book that dealt with peasant state relations in northwestern Nicaragua in the area of Chinandega, where he does a wonderful job of showing how a, 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 a how uh, Caudillo, as you know, apparently as powerful as Anastasio Somoza Garcia, had to negotiate with the peasants um, in trying to gain their support. In the case of contemporary Nicaragua, you can, I think, also see the relative autonomy of the Sandinista rank and file um, at the level of municipal politics. And probably as an aside, I should mention that um, since the municipal elections of 2004, just a bit over half of Nicaragua municipalities are now run by the Sandinista party. In some cases, um, the Sandinista rank and file seem to have demonstrated quite a degree of autonomy from their party's leaders. And here I'm thinking about the case of Granada that I know the best. Um, um, talking to friends from Granada, which is Nicaragua's third largest city, um, a, a actually remark, a rather remarkable event occurred last December. Um, like most city councils, um, they have to essentially, the city council of Granada held an old public meeting um, where they basically have to um, discuss their accomplishments to the population. And at this meeting, what surprised many people was that many rank and file Sandinistas from the barrios of Granada attended this meeting. And when they were given the chance, they openly criticized their party leaders, um, something that caught a lot of my friends by surprise. Um, they criticized the leaders who were in control of the city council for, uh, for being corrupt, for failing to produce uh, more jobs, which is, a, in, in general, for failing to actually meet their major social demands. So one could argue, um, and obviously my evidence is a bit tenuous here, is it's probably at the municipal level where you get a more leftist, uh, a less corrupt form of Sandinismo, a, a kind of Sandinismo that you really don't see at the national level and probably that doesn't really appear that forcefully in, in the newspaper. Um, that said, I think it's still an open question how the rank and file uh, will respond to the new political situation.
But that said, I think it would be a mistake to view the Sandinista rank and file simply as blind followers of, of, a, of a caudillo, in this case of, um, of Daniel Ortega. On the contrary, I think it's possible that the rank and file would put meaningful pressure on Ortega and his government to solve some of the country's most pressing social problems. So let me end by underscoring a point that Alejandro made at the very end of his presentation, that his belief that, um, that the November elections nonetheless might still represent a moment of opportunity. Um, I'm not sure I'd go so far as this might represent an opportunity for regime change. Um, those are his words, not my words. Um, but let's put it this way, even if Ortega maintains his ties with the right, and even if he tries to rule as a caudillo, and as I point out, this is still an open question, but let's assume if he tries to do that, my sense is that the potential strength of the Sandinista rank and file, that up to now has been very disciplined, that, um, that given the strength of the Sandinista rank and file, that the, November, the outcome of the November elections has possibly created um, has created the very real possibility of social change that might actually benefit the majority of the country's population. Thank you.